We are CEOs, executives, educators, and professionals from all sectors of society who support the global expansion of betterment in the world through joy and joyly. I'm your host, Cheryl Lynn, founder of the Chair of Joy Experience. Together, we have developed the World Council of Joy, and our council invites CEOs and innovators from impactful organizations to the Joyly podcast. We showcase how generous, bold, and fully engaged they are in their work and what a culture of joy is to them. Hi, everyone. I am Cheryl Lynn with Joyly. We are on the Joyly podcast we, where we are uh, living a journey through life expansion. And really, we are in an economy experience. And so I'm super excited to continue to talk about this chair of joy that I have here in the studio with me and um, how it impacts the world as far as raising the vibration around the concept of joy. So today, our guest is Mike Fidgen coming, us from, coming to us from from Dubuque, Iowa. So Mike, first of all, welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. Pleasure to Very, be here. So you are with an organization called Hillcrest Family Services, and you came from West Virginia to Dubuque, Iowa. What, what made you exactly want to make that move? I well, know we're both, we're both from the Midwest, so I wanted to just check in to see if that was part of the neat reason to go. Well, I'm going to correct you because uh, West Virginia and, and Virginia are two different, uh, two very different places, but uh, Central Virginia was my uh, place of origin for 30, the last 30 years before I came to Dubuque and I've uh, been in Dubuque for about 10 months now since uh, July of 2020. And I came out here to lead a, a mental health, uh, behavioral health organization. They refer to it actually as brain health out here in Iowa. What was the decision to make the move? I'm just curious if if there is passion behind what you're doing or if was your family wanting to make a move? What was the reason, ultimate reason for the move? Yeah, there were a number of factors, but passion drives so much of what I do in life. And uh, my background has been in community-based uh, mental and behavioral health for the last 30 years. I was with a, a company that started small on the East Coast and scaled to be a national and international company delivering community-based behavioral health services. Actually started in that business as a a direct client service providing um, not a uh, I, I don't have a counseling degree but you know 30 plus years ago it wasn't required to do the direct service work and I finished with that company as the CEO and um, uh, led the sale of the business in 2015 to a large health plan in California called Molina Healthcare um, the the passion for me though uh, really goes back to uh, to childhood uh, parents that were career parole probation officers and um, always uh, impressed upon their children that they should go out into the world anytime they were having a hard time or a rough day and look for somebody that was having it a bit harder. They're easy to come by and uh, do something uh, for them, specifically for them and uh, see how quickly you get out of your own problems and your troubles. and. That uh, litmus test or that test never failed me and uh, led to a, a, a lifelong pursuit of uh, trying to serve others. Are, they, are your mom and dad still with us? Yeah, they're uh, in Delaware now and uh, they're, uh, I think, crossing into their 80s now. So uh, still with us, though. I bet they're very proud of you. I would hope so. Uh, you know, we don't uh, talk too much about... Uh, work uh related things but uh you know in terms of the things that drive uh drive happiness in life most of its relationships so that's what seems to be important to us i find it interesting that they were both parole officers did they meet there and in that environment uh i think they met around a rugby field believe it or not so um my uh my my dad played rugby and my mom uh was actually married to a rugby player and uh the, the relationships for both of them uh, didn't, their first relationships didn't work and their second did. So we ended up a blended family, but I believe rugby was the thing that brought us together. And um, my dad was already into parole and probation services. And uh, my mom, after uh, raising kids to a point of independence, which 30 years ago happened earlier than I think it does today, she uh, started to volunteer and uh, psychiatric facilities and then eventually went back and got some more education and became a parole probation officer herself and outlasted my dad in a number of years doing that. 
Well, thank you for a little bit of um, background. I feel like it's really important to know who we're talking to when it comes to the next questions that I'm going to ask about your, you know, CEO ship and um, how you kind of run the organization. So um, if you don't mind, would you be able to tell us what do you think is the biggest strength of Hillcrest right now? I think the biggest strength of Hillcrest is its people. I often uh, compartmentalize my thinking about uh, this organization and others like it that I've been a part of as people, process, and technology. And I always say people always first. So uh, this is a, a, a service organization. And if you look at it in terms of, of financials, um, 75 to 80 cents of every dollar that's donated or provided by a government uh, funding source for client care goes into our payroll. So it pays for uh, the people that deliver that care. And uh, therefore, our people are our greatest asset, as cliche as that may sound. What an amazing business model. There are many that are not exactly like that or even close to that. Absolutely. I, I'm uh, In the shift I made coming from Virginia to uh, Dubuque, I've also shifted from a for-profit model of community-based uh, uh, mental health services to one that's uh, not-for-profit here at Hillcrest. So uh, even this is, uh, you know, feels even better because, um, you know, margin isn't, isn't the end goal. It's really trying to increase capacity to serve more people with uh, exceptional services provided by exceptional people and uh, driving, uh, you know, the best results that we possibly can in terms of quality of life and, and happiness for the people that we serve. That's really awesome. May I just uh, do a little clarification? I always like to have us talking the same language. So what I've learned over the years and why the chair of joy became a thing was um, I put happiness in the same bucket as fear, worry, anger, and disgust. And that is because happy, like those, they're kind of fleeting and not dependable. So if you're sick or you're, you know, having a miserable day, you might say, you know, I'm really hungry. I'm going to eat a big old fat sloppy cheeseburger and French fries. And then when you're done with that, you're saying, gosh, I don't feel so good. Now I'm feeling fat and the ha you were happy and then you're not happy. So joy, on the other hand, is more sustainable. It's a word that we use at Christmas time or maybe during a surprise birthday party, but something that I think that could be in our vocabulary more often. So if you don't mind, as we go forward, if we could use the word joy more often, I think that's who your employees are. So that's my next, my next question is, would you say you're, based on pay, I'm gonna go with yes, but would you say your employees um, are A, joyful, and B, what are they expecting from you as a leader when it comes to joy? Well, it's a, you know, you said a lot there. So I think that I love the pivot from happy to, to joyful. And uh, you mentioned Christmas and uh, to me, uh, yeah, happiness is more emotional. And I think if we kind of went with the ebbs and flows of our emotions, we'd feel a lot of ups and downs. Whereas, you know, joy is kind of where we anchor our being. And uh, and for me, I you know have spiritual uh, convictions and commitments as where I find my source of joy. So uh, that tends to be pretty steady in my life, regardless of whether the clouds are out or not. I know the sun's above them. So um, as it relates to the employees here, uh, and I refer to uh, our employees as colleagues. A lot of times people refer to folks in their organization as staff. That to me sounds like an infection that I don't wanna get. So, uh, you know, colleagues is how I've, I've tended to relate to uh, the, the, the folks that provide the service. And I also like it because it doesn't make titles too important. We're all uh, in the same organization providing different functions to achieve similar goals. Um, but, I, you know, folks here are um, definitely driven by uh, the, the reward of service to others. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I don't think it's a big surprise that these types of services, uh, social services and social welfare services are um, not well funded and therefore the re the end result for those that make a practice or a living of it is that it's, uh, it's not a large amount of take home pay. Uh, so it's gotta be other things that drive folks uh, commitment and investment to serve people that are in great need of service. And there's an element of joy that that uh, has to bring to them as well to their clients to make that, that equation work. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And uh, who's the person that they go to when there's a little bit of, when it gets complicated, when that isn't the case? Do you get wind of that or is oh. it something that you get to address right away? 
Yeah, I, th I think that's true. I mean, I, I tend to approach leadership with the mindset that uh, if things are going well, then everybody else on the team should get the credit. And when things aren't going well, then blame me and let's let's talk about it. Let's let's figure out um, where we've missed the mark or uh, why the equation isn't working to the benefit of, of both parties or, or more if there are more people than two involved. So um, I find that uh, that, uh, yeah, you know, uh, people come to the top uh oftentimes with complaints, uh, but I also uh, have some pretty general rules. And if you're gonna bring me a problem, bring me three solutions to that problem as well, and uh, we'll have a productive conversation. Yeah, that's very, very clear. And uh, I bet they respect that as well because they know, you know what it is that they need to do to get to the next step. So that's awesome. What a great model. Um, <clears throat> so based on all of that, um, first of all, there's what, 325 employees that I read? Is that right? Yeah, that's that's correct. We're down about 100 employees as a result of the pandemic. So, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, it was about 425 employees, 325 today. And is that all that mostly in Dubuque? Uh, actually, we serve uh, 15 or 16 counties, including Dubuque County. So uh, our, we, ha we have a campus style um, uh, continuum of care here locally, uh, which if you came to our campus, you'd find a school, a gymnasium, a chapel, multiple uh, adult group homes uh, with uh, five adults in them, some uh, adolescent homes with 10 to 12 uh, youth uh, that are uh, receiving services from us, and then a number of programs that operate from this as their uh, base of operation, but they tend to go out in the community more and do things like HIV um, education, tobacco education, involved in the schools and delivering services in schools and things of that nature. So that's incredible. I would love to visit it someday and maybe bring the chair. I travel around the country with it, so it'd be fun to put it in your <laughs> office, actually. Um, but are the, would you say the, um, that you're one of the major employees there? Cause you're only like 58,000, is that right? Yeah, well, I wanna say Dubuque and uh, again, I'm, I'm by no means, I, I couldn't tell you the history of Virginia and I lived there for 30 years. So don't, uh, don't quiz me on Charlottesville or Fredericksburg where I spent most of that time. I want to say 90,000 is, the, is uh, what I remember from a conversation within the last week that somebody here locally referred to uh, Dubuque's population. So are you one of the largest employers? Oh, uh, to that question, um, yeah, I would say so. Although uh, we've got companies like John Deere out here and uh, uh, Flex Steel and IBM was here. And, uh, you know, then uh, I think they, they departed uh, recently and left just a, a few people behind. So uh, there's a lot of industry uh, here. So um, uh, there's some big players, I would say, as a provider of this type of service, human services, behavioral health, mental health, community-based services. Uh, we're one of the, the larger uh, of our kind uh, in, in the counties we serve. Awesome. Awesome. So mental health is intriguing to me, and I think that it's just such an amazing place to be and to serve. And um, would you would you be able to just give me a tiny little bit of history of Hillcrest? I was looking at some of the pictures and some of the buildings sure. that were purchased in 1898. I mean, just amazing, amazing history. Yeah, yeah. so Hillcrest dates back uh, to 1896, and therefore this year is its 125th anniversary. It started as a, a baby fold or a adoption service, um, and uh, it grew from there into uh, welfare programs for single moms and their kids. And uh, from there, it moved more into residential services for youth uh, and ultimately expanded into mental and behavioral health services. Uh, and, and runs a, a continuum, as I uh, indicated earlier, of various programs that are bit heavy on the facility side, bricks and mortar, um, but they also provide some really uh, innovative programs that get out into the community. There's a program called Assertive Community Treatment, which is a team approach to serving folks in their homes and communities when they're uh, at an impasse in life that involves uh, uh, either mental health problem or diagnosis, uh, and we bring the, the service to them. So. Uh, as well as crisis response and other things of that nature. Traditional outpatient counseling is also uh, delivered through about a half dozen mental health centers that we have around the surrounding counties. Wow, no small tasks that you that you took on. 
congratulations on your role and um, good luck. I'm sure it's going to be very expansive. Even coming, you've only been there a few, a few, a few months, right? Since twenty, yeah. yeah so. Lots yes, to do. Ten months. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, this uh, idea of um, joy in the workplace. And I think you've explained how you lead, which is exactly who I thought you were. So I'm so glad that's uh, what, what you are as, as I planned and discovered, because we can have this next conversation about um, longevity. So longevity is really a, some, something that I think that we're all striving for as, as a human race. And mental health is just another one of those um, ideas to get, you know, to get resourced or sourced, if you will. So I came up with a plan called the Chair of Joy Practice, and it's based on neuroscience. I work with Dr. Paul Abel, who is a longevity coach. He's been studying longevity for, I think he had a, a clinic in Beverly Hills of 35 years. So he discovered that at the end of the rainbow, the one thing that we're all missing in life is, believe it or not, joy. So he loves what we're doing. So I wondered if you could do the practice with us. It's really quick and uh, a lot of fun. Sure. Okay, so just put your feet on the ground. I just want you to take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. Just kind of get centered with me. And uh, it's been a busy day, I'm sure. Lots and lots of emails. So just get present. Nothing else matters. Just this at the moment. And okay. And then one more deep breath in. And I want to see if you can tap into one of your most joyful moments of your entire life. If you might have been a young boy or just yesterday or anywhere in between. But something that just kind of gave you goosebumps and you said, this is this is where I have it all figured out. Whenever you're ready, if you could just tell me what that was. Yeah, so uh, I, I, as a kid, um, and I don't know what age I was, but uh, I wasn't driving. So I was younger than 16, but probably older than nine or 10. Uh, I'm in this wooded area uh, outside of uh, where I lived close by Annapolis, Maryland. I grew up near on the Chesapeake Bay and there was a place uh, in our community that they were, the kids referred to as 80 acres. It was. 80 acres of undeveloped wood. And we used to go in there and run and play and bike and, you know, do all sorts of things. So you running me through that exercise just dropped me back to the temperatures and the smells and the feeling of, uh, you know, just fun with, uh, with friends and being a kid. When's the last time you've been in 80 acres of untapped acreage? Oh my gosh, you know, couldn't be further <laughs> from it now with the connection to social media and coffee machines and, you know, uh, the, the malls and uh, billboards and everything else, you know, computer screens. So, uh, yeah, that's, it's been a long time uh, since, since I felt what I, what I, you know, my mind brought me back to. All right, we're going to do the same thing one more time. So okay. one more deep breath in different place, different time. Maybe you were giving a speech, maybe you were at home, maybe it was a family event, uh, food, whatever it is, another joyful place, moment or time. Okay. And go ahead. So what came to my mind, probably cause you said uh, giving a speech or um, that might have triggered this thought was uh, my dad uh, who uh, is, you know, probably 80, 81 this year. Um, was retiring from his job with uh, DC uh, uh, District of Columbia government. Uh, he had worked in adult probation for the better part of his life and uh, retired as a, a deputy director um, for uh, the courts down there. And I just remember uh, getting the opportunity to speak on his behalf in front of all of his uh, friends and our family. And uh, it was you know, a, a chance to recognize him among his uh, his peer group and people that uh, reported to him, as well as uh, my brothers, my sisters, and just let him know what an impact his work ethic and what he you know put his life to uh, had on me. Was he moved by that? He was, yeah, I think so. He wasn't uh, the most expressive person emotionally, but uh, I, I recall him uh, being moved and the way that Dad got moved. That's really special. Well, that's an honor. So that's awesome that you shared both of those memories. So if you could take the 80 acres of wood, it's funny you said 80 in both of those comments, but 80 acres of wood and your dad who's retiring at age 80 um, from his probation work, if there is one word, like the essence of those two memories that you could come up with, what might that be? Uh, 
authentic. Okay, love it. So if you could, so would you say when you're being authentic, that's joy for you and joy is being authentic? Yeah, I think that's right. There's just, uh, there's no errors about anything. It is what it is and it's, you know, uh, it's pure. It is. All right, so I always ask people if you could put, this is a little funky, but we'll get through it. It just takes a second. The first thing that comes to your mind, if you could put this authenticity in some kind of container, any kind of container, big or small, what, what would that container look like? I could put it in a container. Have you ever dropped your phone on the floor, on your face, or in some other embarrassing place? Don't you wish there was something you could attach to your phone case that would help you hold your phone so you don't have to, or at least as much? Introducing Steady Straps, a comfortable, adjustable, strong, elastic strap with 100% Velcro brand closures that helps you hold your phone more securely without dropping it and use it easier and faster, especially one-handed. It's the only smartphone grip accessory without adhesives, and it's 100% wireless charging ready without having to remove or adjust it first. Check us out at SteadyStraps.com and order some today. Boy, you know, I, I had an immediate thought and I was like, no, nah, you wouldn't put it in that, but uh, yes. I, I can't kick it. So it, it'd be a boat of some shape or form, right? My dad liked to sail and uh, he was into sailboats of, you know, progressively bigger sizes over the course of uh, his experience with that. And I was, I was always in boats myself. I had a preference for uh, for motor boats over sailboats, but enjoyed both. So uh, I put it in a boat of some shape. Beautiful, beautiful. Now I just I, I don't say this to many people as we're going through the process, but because you're living it and doing it as a human being already, the idea of taking joy, the essence of authenticity, and making it intangible into the tangible, which is now this boat container thing. And so now I ask people to carry it with us. And we're going on an airplane, and we're getting off the airplane in the Guari Airport. There's three thousand CEOs there, just like you. They're running large corporations you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, they don't understand this joy thing that we're talking about. They don't understand that joy affects the bottom line and that joy is authenticity and authenticity is joy. What, what, what might you say to them? Yeah, so I've had to first walk myself through this picture of getting on a plane with a boat. So the boat got smaller than I'd first envisioned it. It's more of a toy boat. And, you know, I think you said New York or someplace. So I envisioned the little sailboats in Central Park that you can rent at a remote controlled or something. So let's say it's a it's a symbol of, you know, of what you're talking about uh, as it relates to joy and the audience of CEOs uh, that are in, in front of me. And uh, I, I would say, look, you know, you've got it. You've got to release it from yourself in order to enjoy it. Right. So like the boat, you got to put it down and you got to let it go in different directions and go out and come and, and it will, you know, it will come back, but you can't be afraid to, uh, you know, it's not something you hoard. It's not something that uh, is, uh, is a selfish indulgence. It's something that the more that you give it away, the more you get back. How profound is that? Pretty profound, but you know, it was your exercise, not mine. So we didn't script this, but I thought it was pretty daggone good. <laughs> it is when everybody does it. And really the intention is to for me to play it back and let you hear it for yourself. Because I heard, I heard it as I was saying this. Give me a little chill bumps. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, isn't it true that we get caught up in what we're doing and we forget about the things that that drive us and keep us going and what's most important? So I appreciate you sharing that with me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So what do you do that's uh, joyful outside of the office? Oh, boy. I don't know. If, so what I do, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so that's a really hard question. Life has changed so much uh, until the pandemic. Uh, I'm an old dying, don't want to give up jock. So um, I discovered about 10 years ago that old guys still play lacrosse, which was, a, a, you know, the game of my youth. And uh, and we got back together about 10 years ago. And I usually travel to, you know, three or four tournaments a year and play an insane number of games with guys that I've known for 30 years now. And uh, it never grows old. Um, the equation there is that as long as the pain is or as long as the joy is greater than the pain, I keep doing it. So, uh, you know, it's getting closer to equal with each passing year, but it's still greater. And so that's what I do. And 
with the, you know, the, the reality of a pandemic having changed all that and my wife and I having moved out here to Dubuque, the, the beauty of this place is everything's close. We used to live 45 minutes from civilization where we lived in central Virginia on a lake. And now we're within five minutes of downhill skiing, bicycling, um, uh, cross country skiing, uh, movie theaters, uh, golf, you name it, everything, you know, seven minutes, seven miles is about as far as you need to go to get to anything. And then if you want something different or nice, it's, uh, it's about a 40 minute drive. And that's still less than what it used to take me to get into town every day to, you know, buy a gallon of milk where I used to live. Yep. And I bet you don't have some of the traffic issues as well. What do you think? No, no, there's, uh, there's, there's not traffic here compared to what traffic is, especially if you've been in or around DC. All right. Well, I appreciate the fact that we talked about um, your joy in, in multiple facets at work, how you interact with your employees, how you, you know, just have had joy in your own experiences in your own life and even in your current day and age and what you and your wife do to experience joy. So this whole thing for me um, is just, I really want to pound home the conversation with you about the chair of joy. So before I go further into my questions, what is the purple chair behind you? What is that about? That chair? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I joke sometimes, or I should say folks that come into this office often joke that that's, you know, is that the throne? And I say, if it is, that's for you, not for me. I'm either the court jester or, uh, you know, maybe sometimes I'm the queen, but I'm not the king, nor do I want to necessarily have to, you know, sit on that throne, you know, and uh, pass judgment or, uh, you know, oftentimes uh, what the king doesn't realize is, you know, there's a lot more people passing judgment on you than you on others. So, um, yeah, no, I haven't really given too much thought to, uh, to the lavender chair or purple chair or whatever color chair that is behind me, other than that, uh, that sticks out for me because we've chuckled about it from time to time. It's just a comfy chair. You ever watch, right. you ever watch Monty Python torture him with the comfy, comfy chair or the comfy pillows or something like that? Yeah. We'll talk about that in just a second because I, I have a really great idea I want to share with you. But if you if you could pick a chair of joy at home, what would that be? Where would you go somewhere that you could just be about you and your thoughts? Oh boy, I'm not even in a chair. I've got a, a standing desk here actually. So, um, uh, you know, uh, I feel most joyous when I'm when I'm active. You know, I'm not I'm not. Uh, I love a soft chair and a couch and all, you know, a fire and a book and stuff like that, but that's slowing down. That's not, you know, getting my energy and, and my engagement uh, where I like it to be. But I love to stand around uh, a fire, you know, and just uh, maybe from, from again, back to childhood and some of the work that I did in that wilderness residential program, uh, it's just a very peaceful, place and a place that I can uh, kind of be with my thoughts. And uh, sometimes the, the fire kind of, uh, you know, each fire has its own own kind of life and shape to it. So uh, just an experience I enjoy. I'm right there with you. When we moved here where we are now, we moved away from our beautiful cabin up in Michigan, four acres. I had six fireplaces everywhere on the property. It was just, I feel yeah. the exact same way. So if I were to say to you in general, and I think this is important is for other CEOs listening, is that joy, uh, joy when, when you're making decisions in joy, so if whether it's in the fire or in a chair by the fire <laughs> or in a chair of joy, the decision, wouldn't you agree, based on your silence and your contemplating and your thought is better than coming from a place of stress or worry or chaos or fear. Tell oh, me about that. 110%, absolutely. I think uh, my, uh, my personality and my wiring, my brain works with open loops. So, you know, I'm constantly grinding on uh, an issue to solve or uh, a problem to uh, improve, fix, et cetera. And uh, I find that it's usually, uh, you know, when I'm able to release a lot of the tension of, uh, you know, actively trying to solve the problem that the answers come. And it's, you know, I can be on a treadmill or jogging or biking or, you know, doing anything in sort of a, a relaxed kind of released way. And, uh, and those, you know, those connections start to be made. And you now next thing I know, I'm walking into a meeting going, I've got the answer. 
here's what we need to do, or at least here's what I think we need to do. So would you agree that that skill is a little bit few and far between? Yeah, I don't know that, you know, what you're describing it as a skill and, uh, you know, I guess if it's a skill, I, you know, for me personally, I don't, I wouldn't know how to teach that. I don't wouldn't, you know, really know how to articulate how that slowing down and, and kind of being able to uh, center your, your, your brain in a way that allows for you to be attentive uh, to what's really in the middle of what are otherwise very busy thoughts, right? Because I think somewhere in there, there's the answer. We just sometimes don't slow down long enough to hear what's being whispered to us. So it's a matter of finding that uh, space and, uh, and presence to listen. I always say that if people are Christian or God fearing that God, you can't hear God speaking because you're blabbing all the time, right? People are so noisy and loud. It's like, how do you expect him to talk to you or answer or say anything to you if you keep talking all the time? <laughs> yeah, no, I like there's a cartoon out there that I think some people are familiar with, with the guy standing on the roof of his house in the flood and, you know, saying, God's going to save me. God's going to save me to the boat that comes, the helicopter that comes, everybody that comes by to help and he ends up in heaven and, you know, God, why didn't you save me? And God says to him, I sent a boat, I sent a helicopter. I go, why weren't you listening to me? You know, so you got to be attentive. You know, if you're looking for a, a certain type of God that's going to show up, you might be missing God. <laughs> that's adorable all right so just to kind of kind of wrap up here if you were to if i were to ask you could you find your place of joy or your fireplace or something more often is it possible that more even more solutions and more growth and more development could occur yeah absolutely i think that's true and i also think that uh you know i think there are seasons for a reason so um, you know, there's sometimes things can't be forced. So I think it's that, that sort of thing can be accelerated to a point. But, you know, even going back to my, my cartoon description of God, you know, there are some times where it's yes, no, and other times where it's wait, you know. So, you know, you might be having a desert experience. And even if I can help you or you can help me become more peaceful and centered doesn't necessarily mean that the answer that I need is going to come quicker if it's not the right time for the answer. Also, and it also doesn't mean that joy is the thing that happens every day, all day long, right? There's ebb and flow. You we're human. We have to live all the emotions and we get to experience that. You know, that's what makes us even more joyful when, when those moments do come. We're more appreciative. Well, yeah, it's a great point. And I often... I find, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of both individuals I've talked to and groups I've talked to where, and I don't know where this, you know, just kind of a lived experience that I think we all have. Uh, but I've often said, look, uh, you know, the, the valleys and the mountaintops, right? Uh, profound joy is accentuated by profound sorrow and loss. And uh, folks that have had those extremes you know, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword, right? But, you know, people that are really struggling and in the work that I've done for over 30 years, you know, meet more people that are struggling than that can claim that their life has been full of joy. Um, but they know when they're involved in joy because they've, they've experienced and lived deep sorrow. So, you know, I just think it's a part of living on earth. You know, one doesn't come without the other. Absolutely. And I think the process that we just took you through memory, having two memories and having a connecting word, which was yours, was yours was authentic. If we did this with a team, you know, if we brought 30 of your people in and they sat around in the chair or whatever, they would all have different experiences. They would all have different words. And if they did it later that afternoon, they'd all have different experiences and all have different words. And it's just something that builds upon and creates a, a higher vibration, if you will. So... Yeah, I totally agree with you. And uh, I think our work together here today and letting other CEOs know that this is not all that easy and that it does take work and it takes constant attention and uh, focus every day. I can tell that that's, that's who you are. So I really appreciate that. My last question for you is that beautiful little uh, um, boat that you put in the, the Central Park River um, or lake, 
if you could give that away to someone today, who would it be? It's it's a boat full of authenticity. Who could you give it to today? Oh boy, that's a really um, that's a good question. And uh, my immediate thought would be the senior leadership team that I'm involved with. Um, uh, it's been a rather uh, transformational time for the business, and therefore for the people in the business and the four leaders that. Uh, directly report into me. Um, we've we've undertaken a lot of uh, change in the ten months that I've been here. Some of that brought about by uh, virtue of the fact that I'm a new leader uh, that is bringing new ways of doing things and thinking about things. But also the pandemic. Um, you know, they had done so much work uh, to just stabilize this business uh, long before I ever arrived here. Uh, and I think they were tired and they were looking for somebody to. Uh, take over the rain. So, you know, there was an element of risk and vulnerability and trust um, all, you know, wrapped up together. Uh, and uh, I think that, that uh, you know, they're worn out. And uh, so I would want them to, uh, you know, I'd want them to have it. I think they've earned it. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. And the the people that are coming out on the other side of this pandemic, even stronger and more sure of who they are and what they're doing, I think is just building the fabric of our, of our nation even stronger. So absolutely. All right. I would just love to hear a takeaway from this interview today and uh, any last words you'd like to share with our audience. Well, the takeaway is your your chair. You know, I told you about mine, and uh, you didn't tell me enough about yours. Other than then, you like to take it on the road with you. So I'm not sure if this is a model chair or if you've got to like get a U-Haul and throw that uh, you know full size chair in it before you show up at somebody's office and say uh, you know chair ladies here. Or how do you actually refer to yourself, Cheryl Lynn, when you're showing up with your chair? I, I am the chair of joy, uh, so I consider myself, um, not only is it the chair of joy, but it's the chair of joy. And on my website, I describe, describe it kind of as the Mona Lisa or the Mona Larry. When people sit in it, they feel very elevated and they feel, you know, just kind of tuned in and tapped in and that for once the spotlight is on them. And so when people, when they sit in the chair and it's, the chair is just, it's about the chair, but it isn't. When they when they sit in the, the chair of joy, whether it's yours or mine, there is transformation. They come, they sit down as one person and they come out differently in that they understand that, oh, what joy was actually inside of me all this time, right? right? And it's not something I have to spend money on or go get. So, so yes, it's a, it just depends. We do chair of joy conversations via the virtual or, or in person. Either way, they are amazing and fun. Yeah, that's great. Well, my takeaway is that uh, I think you just said it, um, you know, it's always there, right? It's a matter of tapping into it and uh, you have to be intentional, uh, but being intentional, you know, uh, isn't just uh, all about discipline and scheduling and, you know, showing up consistently. It's about being able to slow down and listen, listen to listen to others and, uh, you know, listen to your, your own inner dialogue and Easier said than done. I am by no means a master of that, but uh, you know, uh, again, I don't think joy is uh, necessarily you know something that people live at that mountaintop all the time. So awesome. And any other words, just on behalf of Hillcrest, or anything else you'd like to say to our CEOs that are listening today? Uh, I would just say, you know, bring your authentic self uh, into. Uh, into each uh, each meeting, be present with people. There's a reason that you are hired to that position, and uh, you know there's uh, you know don't don't try to be somebody uh, else. There's uh, you know er everybody else is taken, so just go ahead and be you. <laughs> We'll stick around a little bit after this, Mike. I'd love to speak with you some more, but thank you very much for being on our show today. I think Mike enlightened us uh, just based on who he is as a human being. I think that that getting to know his parents, you know, the speech that you gave for your father, you know, running free in the 80 acres and you know, the whole ship, the whole process and how it impacts your everyday life is just profound. So I just want to thank you very much for being on the show today and talking about joy. It seems a little woo-woo. Um, I'm curious why you said yes. Why did you say yes to this interview? I'm a networker and I don't uh, have, you know, the most <laughs> tremendous boundaries and filters and I'm a risk taker. And so this all fits entirely with my personality. I totally hear you and thank you again for that. Some people think, you know, Joy, what, what are we talking about? But I think it's an important conversation to have. So you have a fabulous day and uh, 
thank you all for listening. And we'll uh, be back again with another amazing CEO uh, in the Joy Lee podcast. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.